held the snow off for a couple of days, and we're getting church in tomorrow, and then the snow is coming. Yay. <laughs> I think. Um, my sister-in-law, she's the one who's been praying for this, and when you see Becky, Let's pray, and then we'll get into Ephesians. Father, we thank you for your, just your love, Lord, how your love washes over us, and it transforms us, and it works to change us, Lord, and it's just such a beautiful gift from you. So we thank you for your word that we get to read, and it um, washes us and cleanses us, Lord, and, and it draws us closer to you, and we're so thankful for that. Um, thank you that you love us, and, re and regardless of our actions and what we do, you just simply love us unconditionally. We thank you for that. We ask that you would be with us as we open your word today, Lord, that it would not be any of me, um, Father, that I would be completely out of the way, and that your Holy Spirit would work and speak to each of us individually as you so desire to work in our hearts tonight. So we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so tonight we are going to look at the second of the two prayers in the book of Ephesians, okay? So the first prayer was in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 15, and that's the prayer where um, Paul prayed five things, that the, eye, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would know the hope of their calling, um, that prayer. So tonight we're going to take a look at the second prayer in the book of Ephesians. Okay, so we're going to be in chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to be um, starting in verse 14. Hi hey guys, so Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Um, I'm going to read this, the end of this chapter, and then we're just going to start unpacking it, okay? So, um, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, uh, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right, so as we unpack this tonight, what we're going to see um, is an insight into Paul's heart for the church in Ephesus. This is like his fatherly heart towards this, this church is coming out, okay? He loved the church. He desired for the church to walk in the fullness of knowing God. And that is that um, his heart was that they would make Jesus the center of their lives, that Jesus would be the center. So notice when we get into this prayer that he didn't pray for behavioral changes. Nowhere in there does he say, and I hope and I pray that they don't swear anymore. Right? And that they would be kind to me. He doesn't say that. He prays that, the, that their hearts would be focused and filled and Jesus would be the center. Because he knows that if Jesus is the center, then all the behavioral pieces fall into place because the Spirit does the work in the heart of man. Okay? So, um, and I know for those in this room who are mothers and grandmothers and you are pouring God's word into your children and to your grandchildren, that's your heart too, that, that God, that Jesus would be the center of your children and your grandchildren's lives. But those of you who are pouring into other people, you're discipling and you're mentoring, it's the same heart, isn't it? That you want those people that you're pouring into, that their lives would be centered on Jesus. Because when we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit does the change that he desires to do within us, right? So we're all on separate journeys, and what the Spirit's doing in my life and how he's changing and transforming me is at a different rate and a different pace and a different order than he's doing to Gene, 
right? And so she may have already come to the understanding that this is how I'm to now live in certain respects, and I haven't gotten there yet. Or I've gotten there in this area, but she hasn't. Do you know what I mean? So God's doing the work, but it's in his time and his way. So verse 14, for this reason, for this reason. So remember, this is a letter. And when the church in Ephesus got the letter, they read it from the beginning to the end, right? From the dear to the sincerely. They read it all in one shot. There wasn't chapters, there wasn't verses, there wasn't coming uh, a month later and sitting down and going, hmm, what was that? It was always in context. So I want to make sure that we're learning it in context. So for what reason? That's what we have to ask ourselves. So for what reason? Well, we have to go back and, um, and make sure it's in context and what happened before this prayer. What did Paul unveil as we looked at for the last two sessions we were together? The mystery. Do you remember the mystery? Yes, Jews and Gentiles are one. That's exactly right. So the great mystery has been unveiled. Okay, so the middle wall of separation was broken down. The Jew and the Gentile are no longer separated, but now have been made into one. Into one what? into one family, into one church, right? That was all of um, chapter 2, verse 11 to three, chapter 3, verse 13, okay? All of that, that mystery being unveiled. That both the Jew and the Gentile now have access to the Father in the same manner, which is through the sacrifice and the blood of Jesus. Nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus, Jew and Gentile alike, okay? And that we, the Gentiles, which would be us, the Gentiles, is, are there any born-again Jews in this room? Okay, so we're all Gentiles in here, okay? So us. The Gentiles are no longer aliens and strangers, and they're no longer um, without Christ. Remember what a wretched person we were as Gentiles without Jesus. Remember that? So the Jew now, though, is no longer looking forward to the coming Messiah, right? And he's no longer um, under bondage to the law. He's been set free from that. And so for this reason, for this reason that the Jew and the Gentile, that we're now all on equal ground before the cross, that's the reason Paul's going to pray. He's going to pray for, um, the letter was written to the Ephesians. So it was written to the Gentile church, not the Jewish church. It was written to the Gentile church. Okay. So he's reminded the Gentile church that they are not second-class citizens in the kingdom of heaven and that they have just as much access to the Father and they have an equal inheritance as the Jewish believer who paved the way. You guys with me? All right. So now that's the mystery. That's the great plan of the ages. It's been unfolded, unveiled, I should say. And now Paul is going to pray for the gentile church okay this is what he's praying he's praying for um he's and remember the gentile church that includes us so this prayer is for us as well okay pray it for yourself ask your sisters to pray it for you your husband to pray it for you your children to pray it for you this is deep um wonderful stuff Okay, so I bow my knee to the Father. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So he bows his knee, and that's, this is the posture that he takes. But understand, we don't have to bow our knee to pray. I think we all understand that. But it's the posture of the heart. right? The po Sometimes we bow because we change the posture of our body to match the posture of our heart. But... We can pray while we're driving in the car. We can pray anywhere. We know that, okay? So Paul is just talking that at this point, he bows his knee. It's an act of humility. It's an act of submission and understanding who he is in light of a holy God, right? God is all-powerful. Paul is not. And he's bowing his knee to the Father. As Jesus taught us to pray, we pray to the Father, right? Our Father who art in heaven. And um, we pray to the Father through the Son, and the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit, okay? So 
So from the, whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, again, this act of unity, of uniting the body, both Jew and Gentile, as one family are named, God is the father of the Jew and the Gentile. So verse 16, that he, I bow my knee to the father, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So Paul is now going to pray for four specific things for the church. Okay, he's going to pray for four specific things. The first thing is what we see here in verse 16, that the believer would be strengthened with might in the inner man. That's the first thing he's praying for the church. That the believer would be strengthened with might in the inner man. And this is through the Spirit, and it's according to His riches in glory. Okay? To the riches of His glory. So, man is a triune being. We were created in the image of God. God is a triune God. And I, I believe that man is a triune being. And we have a mind, we have a body, and we have a spirit, a soul, right? which would make us triune in the image of God. So we work, some of us, quite hard at um, strengthening our physical bodies, right? We work out, we beat our bodies into submission, but I would venture to say, we, some of us don't do that, but some of us do. I think that gang just walked in. There they are, over there. Um, but I would venture to say that we strengthen our bodies. When our tummies growl, and even when they don't, what do we do? We feed it, right? So it, without food, then we're not strengthening our body. So some of us can strengthen our body through food quite well. I love to eat. Anybody else join me? All right, very good. You guys can afford it because you're beating your body into submission with other ways. <laughs> so when we're thirsty, what do we do? We drink. When we're sleepy, what do we do? We sleep, right? So we are strengthening our physical bodies. We do that, we do that without really even thinking, most of us. We just do those things, okay? And then we also work, I would say, to strengthen our minds. So how do we do that? We go to school. We used to go to school. Um, we memorize things, right? We learn. I'm an active learner. I love to learn, always have, and I continue that process. I learn, um, I read, and right, you guys? You know, we do things to strengthen our minds. I um, am taking Spanish classes, and somebody asked me, do you like taking Spanish classes? And I said, I love it. And the reason I love it is because it challenges my brain. And you know, as we get older, it's easy to just do what we always do and not challenge our thinking. And so I love taking Spanish because I'm challenging myself. It's, I'm not five years old anymore. It doesn't just come quick like a five-year-old, right? So I have to really think, and that doesn't make sense. And that's not how we say it in English and you know, all those kinds of things, right? So we do a lot to strengthen our minds as we age, we forget things much quicker and just easier. We forget things. I walk into a room and I'm like, why am I in this room? And then I go back into the other room to remind myself of why I went back into the other room, right? So, so we write things down and we make lists and we send ourselves notes and reminders. I email myself so that when I come into the office, I remember what I have to do when I walk in the door, right? So we do things to strengthen our minds. But and all those things are important, and our bodies are intricately crafted and designed, right? But Paul doesn't pray that the physical body would be strengthened, and he doesn't pray that their minds and their thinking processing would be strengthened. What does he pray for? That their inner uh, man would be strengthened. That's the spirit man. He prays that the spirit of the man would be strengthened, okay? So... How does he say it? That he would, um, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that spiritual part of your body. And he doesn't pray for just a simple strengthening. He prays that you would be strengthened with all might, right? 
And that word might, I'm gonna give you a second to guess what that word might comes from. What's my favorite word when it comes to power? Dynamite, dunamis, it's dunamis, that's right, which is dynamite power. And dynamite has the power to change things, right? When I um, stick a piece of dynamite in a building, <laughs> what's it gonna do? It's gonna blow up, right? It's gonna change the structure of that building, right? <laughs> oh, okay, Susan, what is it? <laughs> when you do what? When it blows things up. When it, it has power to blow things up. Your son was speaking to us that night. Yes, it has power to blow things up. Actually, I think Micah gave the analogy that you can go ice fishing with dynamite. <laughs> and you stick the dynamite in the hole in the ice and it blows up the ice and the fish too. Yeah, the fish too. <laughs> that's not fair. That's not the way you do That's not how you go ice fishing, is it? That's not fair to the fish. <laughs> she said he should work to get those fish, not blow them up. All right, so this dynamite power is what, what Paul prays for, that the inner man would be strengthened um, with dynamite power. But Paul understood that when the inner man, when the spirit man is strengthened with all might through the spirit, then the rest of man falls into place. So Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you, right? And he talks about, he talks about um, our clothing and our food. If you go back to Matthew 6, that's what he's talking about, being, being provided for. So Paul understands that when the inner man, when the spirit is seeking first the kingdom of God, then our, then our what does Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so the, the natural man falls into line, right? God takes care of the natural man to sustain the natural man. He provides for us. And God provides for our emotional stability, too. If our inner man is walking according to the scripture and according to the ways that he has created, then the mind falls into line with that as well, okay? You guys with me? Okay, so I, I want you to understand that um, Paul doesn't pray that the church would find its strength in the inner man through his own works, though. He says that the spirit would strengthen the inner man, not that you would work to strengthen your inner man. There's a difference. And what I mean by that is this. Paul doesn't pray that you would go to church and your inner man would be strengthened. He doesn't pray that you would read your Bible and your inner man would be strengthened. He doesn't pray that you would pray and your inner man would be strengthened. Or that you would do good things or you would serve in this place, that you would live worthy of your calling. All those things are good and they're all things that we should be doing because they're keys to our life. But it's the spirit, our strength of the inner man is according to the riches of his glory, of Jesus' glory, is according to his riches, and he will strengthen the inner man. He will use these things, coming to church, walking in fellowship, walking worthy of your calling, reading your Bible. Um, did I miss something? He'll use doing, serving others. He'll use those things, but he's the one doing, doing the strengthening of the inner man. Okay? You guys are looking at me funny. You okay? Yeah. Okay. So, the strength comes from where? The Lord. It comes from his riches of Jesus' glory, right? It's his riches. And the beauty of his riches is they never run out. So if you're feeling weak in the inner man, I'm going to encourage you to go to the riches of his glory. Go to him and seek strength from him in the inner man. I think we rely too much on our own abilities in order to strengthen ourselves. 
we, we think that we can do it all. But it comes through the fact that we need to ask God. We need to ask the Spirit to strengthen us and give us what we need. Because His riches never run out. They never corrupt. They never fade. They never go bankrupt. They never get tired. His riches aren't controlled by the, the man-made government. And they're not um, suspect to inflation. Right? So that's always as much as we need whenever we need it and he's willing to bestow it upon us okay so our our strength needs to come from the spirit and his riches in chapter 3 verse 8 says that they're unsearchable there's so many we can't even find them there's so much of it his riches are so vast and so grand so according to his riches he provides everything we need pertaining to life everything we need verse 17 um, number two, this is the second thing Paul, Paul prays for. The first thing is that we would be strengthened with might in the inner man. The second thing is that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So in John chapter 14 through 16, Jesus was sharing his final words with the disciples, right? He was he was sharing his heart with them, he was praying for the disciples, and then he was praying for himself with the disciples, okay? So in John 14 through 16, and what he says before he leaves is, I am in the, my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So look, we're looking at Christ dwelling in our hearts richly through faith, that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. He also says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He also says, abide in me, and I will in you. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then I will, I will be with you, right? If my words abide in you. And then he also says, if he who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. This whole concept of we're abiding in Christ, we're dwelling in Christ, with Christ, but then he turns around and he abides in us. The Father's in him, so the Father is ultimately in us then too, right? So this concept of abiding and, and dwelling, it's not a concept of a stranger. It's not like a stranger comes and takes residence in a hotel and stays for a week. It's a concept of a permanent dwelling, and it's a relationship, a familiar, I'm having a hard time with my words tonight, familiar rarity, okay? Fam does that make sense? Familiar, say it louder. <laughs> Familiarity, okay? It's this, that I know something, I'm familiar with it, okay? That I'm familiar with God, and he's gonna take residence, a permanent dwelling in my home like a structure, like a house. That's where he's going to dwell, okay? So that's that concept of abiding and dwelling. And this can only happen through faith, okay? It only happens through faith that, that Christ comes and takes up residence in my home, in my heart. And so are you allowing Christ to take residence in your heart? Do you invite him to come and stay there, or do you just invite him when it's convenient for you? Hey, come along with me today. I need some strengthening today. He wants to take permanent residence and go everywhere with you. And then, the really cool thing, he wants to clean up, too. Like, he wants to clean up and do the dishes and sweep the cobwebs and, and, and scrub the toilets for you in that heart. He's not asking you to do it. He's coming to live with you, and he's doing all that work, too. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so verse 17, the second part of verse 17, this is the third thing now that Paul is going to pray for the church, okay? So he says that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So, the first part of this verse, um, or this section, 
The second part of verse 17 is that you being rooted and grounded in love, that's your position. He says, okay, so you, church, are rooted and grounded in love. Okay? Statement. This is, this is where you are. This is your position. Because of that, now I'm going to pray that you would be able to understand, to comprehend the love of Christ. And then he goes on to say that, that this love, high and wide and long and deep, that's how vast this love is. He goes on to express the love of Christ, okay? So he says, you um, were saved through the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, which was shed because of his love for you, right? So Jesus loved you and he saved you while you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We saw that in chapter two. While we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Then he can't help but love you because that's his very character. God is love. So Jesus loves you because that's his character. He can't help but love you. It has nothing to do with you and what you've done. Now some of you have come from homes where your love, the love you received was based on the actions that you performed. Do, do I need to say that again? Some of you grew up in homes where the love that you received was based on the actions that you performed, on the things that you did. If you were a good girl, then you were loved. And if you weren't a good girl, then that was withheld from you. You received anger instead. Some of you, yes or no? Okay, so I know some of you have experienced that. So, so that's not the love that our Savior has for us. His love for us is based on him. It's based on his character. It has nothing to do with us and what we do. There, I, 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 will, I will say this until I'm in the grave. And then when I stand before the Lord, I will thank him for this. There is nothing you can do to make God love you any less. And the, and the opposite of that is true. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. He loves you because it's who he is. His very character is love, okay? So it's an unconditional love. And it's bestowed on us from the Father, it's bestowed on us from the Son, and it's bestowed on us from the Holy Spirit. The whole Godhead just lavishes you with his love. He just pours it on you. It's like so much you can't even breathe. Okay, um, I think it's too much for our mortal minds to grasp and comprehend how immense his love is for us. I think we get glimpses of it. I think we get pieces of it. And yet Paul at the same time prays that we would comprehend it because it's not based on feelings. His love isn't based on our emotions. His love isn't something suspect. It's not... We don't have to go out and look for it. God tells us about his love and how amazing and how vast and how lavish it is. We just have to accept it and receive it. Again, because it's not based on anything we do. It's based on his character. Okay, so Paul says that we are rooted and grounded in love. So think about that. This is our position. This is just a natural product. Because of our salvation, this is what we've now, we live our lives. We're rooted in love. So can you guys imagine a tree? What's at the top of the tree? The leaves and the branches, right? What's at the bottom of the tree? The roots. And where do the roots go? Into the ground, into the soil, right? So imagine, if you will, then that soil is God's love. And so the roots dig down into the soil, and what does the soil do? It covers the roots, right? But what else does the soil do? It, yes, it feeds it. It nourishes the tree, and it causes what to happen? Growth, right? And sustenance. So imagine that. So the tree, it digs its roots down into the ground, and in the ground, we are rooted in love. Then he says that we are grounded in love. 
So think then, if you will, as a foundation. When a house is built, it's built on a firm foundation. It's built on a foundation. Hopefully, it's a firm foundation, right? <laughs> but the foundation is what causes the house to remain firm when it's being built, right? It stands against the, the, the storms, hopefully. It stands against um, the wind and the rain and the harshness of the sun. It stands against all those things. It's rooted, the, uh, I'm sorry, it's founded on love. So imagine that. So we're rooted, the soil around our roots is love. Our foundation is love. His love is the base of our lives in him. Okay? So that, Paul says, this is your position. So he's praying that as we learn precept upon precept and glory upon glory, lesson upon lesson, as we learn of God's faithfulness again and again, all those lessons that we learn from living a life of living with Jesus, he's praying that our roots would grow deeper into that soil of his love and that our minds and our hearts would begin to grasp just how vast his love is for us. I think that for a long time in my own walk with the Lord, I didn't, I couldn't even begin to grasp his love for me. And it wasn't until I began to stop and go, wow, wait a minute. You mean you accept me because you accept me, not because I had to earn your acceptance? You know, chapter one. You love me and you chose me even though you knew all the things that I would do that are wrong? Wait, you knew all the things I would do that are wrong even after I said, I want you as my savior and you still chose me and accepted me. And then I began to receive that love and it began to transform my heart and soften this wretched soul that I am. Because without Jesus, I'm a pretty nasty person. I am not very kind. I'm not very nice. And yet, when I began to receive his love, he began to soften that piece of me. And I'm still a work in progress. I can still be mean and nasty. And we're all a work in progress. Thank you, Jean. So, um... I don't know. That's my encouragement to you. And if you haven't received his love, then I'm going to encourage you in your devotional walk, in your time with the Lord, in your prayer time, to remember I said, let's practice being quiet before the Lord. And maybe that's something you need to say, Lord, I, I want to experience your love today. I want to understand the vastness of your love and how you actually do love me. And that it's not based on me, it's based on you. I want to understand that. And as I began to step up, sit before him and allow him to work in my heart and in my mind, he began to reveal just how great his love was. There was a day I was struggling with, with an issue um, with one of my children. And I was, um, I was really struggling. And I couldn't figure out, why am I so angry about this? Why am I so angry? And why can't I not let this go? And I remember being called, like I felt like he was calling me to come and sit with him and spend time with him. So I, I got myself away and I sat down and I said, Lord, I want to just let this go. This is not of you. This is of my flesh and this is of me. So how do I let this go? And he reminded me of his great love. He, and he just said, I just felt this overwhelming sense. He said, I love you. And I said, I know you love me, but I can't let this go. How do I let this go? And I remember just feeling like I needed to receive his love. And then this vision came into my mind, this picture. He gave me this beautiful picture of that tree planted, just like this tree, rooted in love. And this big rock was in the way of where my root was going. And that big rock was the issue that I was facing with. And I kept hitting this rock. And then as I was watching my root keep hitting this rock, I, I saw this, this hand come through and grab my root and move it into the dirt and the soil and his love. And that, at that moment, that 
issue that I was struggling with was gone because I was able to receive his love and his love is what changed my mind. His love is what took hold of those thoughts that I was trying to get captive and it's what caused them to move in a different direction and into his love, rather into the rock that was immovable. I couldn't change that rock. I couldn't change what, what, whatever it was. I don't remember now what my child was doing, but I was the one causing the problems because I wasn't in his love. I was, I was focused on that issue. Do you know what I mean? It's an encouragement to you. His love, he goes on to say that you would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height of his love. His love is so wide, it's wider than the east is from the west. Remember, he remembers our sins as far as the east is from the west. Psalm um, 103.12. And why the east from the west? Because they never meet. Okay? It's as deep as the deepest parts of the ocean. I think of Jonah, who was down in the depths, in the, in the belly of a great fish. And he says, as he's praying to, to the Lord, he's talking about being in the depths of Sheol, right? As far down as you could possibly be. And yet God's love found him in the depths of that fish's belly. Fish's belly. Or in the pit and the dungeon with Joseph. His love was there with Joseph, too. It's, um, it's so vast and so... It goes so deep that it goes into the deepest, darkest places that you could ever go. And I've been to some pretty dark places. Those, those pits of depression that some of you go through, that some of you battle, his love is there. Those dark places of sin that you can't seem to escape in your own power and your own strength, his love is there. It's beckoning you. It's pulling you out. It's wrapping its loving arms around you. It's giving you hope and it's giving you strength. In those dark places of um, what people have done to you, his love is even there. His love is high to the highest mountain, to outer space, and to heaven, where we're seated in the heavenlies with Christ. His love is as high as that. And it's as long. It, it, his love pursued me my entire life, from before I knew him, which I was eight when I accepted the Lord. But as I look back in my life, I can see that he was pursuing me even before that point in time. And he has pursued me ever since. And when I have, when I have doubted him and when I went astray in my teenage years and I thought, oh, surely there's another way than this way, he kept bringing me back. When I would visit churches I had no business visiting and I heard, um, lots of false teaching, but the moment I heard that Jesus and Satan were brothers, and God was their father, and Mother Nature was their mother, I was out of there, because his love was pursuing me, and he was teaching me truth. That's how long his love is. Jeremiah 31, 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Psalm 139, such a great psalm for so many reasons, but it talks about this very thing, that his love, where can I go from your presence, right? Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. 
but the night shines as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. Where can I go from your presence, right? Even there, your right hand will hold me. His love is so vast, and yet he has expressed his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8, right? First John 3, 1 says that, Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. Like you just, it's so much you can't take it all in. John 15, 13 says he has given, um, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. He's given himself as a love offering for you. And so, you know, again, we don't have to guess or imagine or wonder if God loves us. It's laid out in his scripture that he truly does love us. And it's not, again, based on our emotions or our feelings or speculations. Hmm, I wonder if God loves me today. Yes, he does. He does. And he went out of his way to tell you that he loves you. And he continues to go out of his way to tell you that he loves you. Okay, so verse 19, the second part of verse 19, and this is the fourth thing that Paul prayed for. So the first thing is that you would be strengthened in the inner man through his spirit, that um, number two, Christ would dwell in your hearts. Number three, that you would be able to comprehend or to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, by the way. So we'll never fully be able to understand it. Linda and I were talking about this. Well, I think we get glimpses, but when we get to heaven, we'll understand it. You know, in our finite minds, I'm not sure we can fully understand it. We get glimpses. And then the fourth thing he says is that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This verse plagued me for years. Because how, how in the world can we be filled with all the fullness of God? Doesn't it blow your mind to just stop and think about that? Do you feel like you're filled with, filled with all the fullness of God? No? Who says yes? I want to live with you. <laughs> But we are. That's what Paul prays for, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. That blows my mind. So, what does that mean? I still wrap my head around it, right? So, filled with God. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. So, we know that, that Christ, if we abide in Christ, and Christ abides in us. So, we're filled with Jesus, okay? If I'm abiding with him, then he's abiding with me. But then he says... I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but when I leave, the Father will send someone in my place. And then the Spirit comes, and he indwells us, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. He doesn't say, hmm, I'm just going to give you part of me. No, he gives us all of himself. He holds nothing back. And he lives within us. So if we're walking, if we're living filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, if we're living filled with the Holy Spirit then we can't be living according to the flesh, right? I can't do both. I can't live according to the spirit and according to the flesh at the same time. They're, they go in opposite directions. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8 tells us that if I live according to my flesh, that's death. But if I live according to my spirit, then that's life. They're two opposite. It's like just, just a juxtapositions, right? Two opposite positions. I can't live in both at the same time. God has a plan for my life, but so does the enemy. So which plan am I going to walk according to? Right? But the mind that is set on the things of the flesh is set on the things of this world and on death. And the mind that is set on the things of the spirit is, is set on life. Romans 8. I spent months in Romans 8 because it just boggled my mind. And then Paul says, how can I do the things that I don't want to do when I don't do the things that I do want to do? And that's another whole thing, right? But we've been filled with all the fullness of God. So we can live with power because we've been, we've been strengthened in the inner man, man through the might and the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can live according to the power of the Holy Spirit because... Because God said we could. Amen. I mean, it's that simple, right? But I 
I think we make it too difficult. So he says that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. Filled. That word is actually completed. Leebu. It's completed with God. There's nothing you're lacking. You are filled to the capacity. You lack nothing. So just as the Father was in Jesus, while Jesus was here on the earth, right? The Father filled Jesus and he guided Jesus, he directed Jesus, all while Jesus was fulfilling the plan of the Father. So the Spirit fills us and guides us and directs us and empowers us to do the will of the Father. We're filled with all the fullness of God. We're completed in him. We lack nothing. Again, you know that emoji with the mind blown? That's me. Often when I read the scripture, I'm like, wait, but how come I'm not living this way? Right? Part of it is because I live like the Ephesians. I'm bankrupt. I forget who I am in Christ. And that's why we have to be in the word, continually reminding ourselves of who we are and what he has done. Right? And we have to crucify that old man. Every single moment of the day for me. Every single moment of the day, okay? So, you know, um, you've, heard that, you've heard that saying that there's a, there's a hole in every man it's a, and it can only be filled by God because it's a God-shaped hole, right? You, you've heard that. How many of you have not heard that? Okay, so everybody's heard that. So, um, there's a God, so everybody, there's a void in your life. And it can only be filled by God. So it's a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. But we try to fill it with other things, right? And so you know this, you've heard this before, but how many of you, and I ask this because I had to stop and ask myself this, because I go through these really crazy seasons where I'm filling this God-shaped void with everything but God. Oh, I go through the motions, I read and I pray, but then I begin to do other things that I seek to fill my life with instead of with God. So how many of you have one of these things? How many of you ever sit in a chair and do this? Do you know this motion? Yeah, that scrolling motion? It happens usually on social media, right? So I read this book called The Common Rule, great book by the way, and it's a, it, it, the, the author of the book says, um, when your thumb is scrolling, you're trying to fill something that God should be filling. Mm -hmm. That is the common rule? Or the, the common rule. R-U-L-E. R-U-L-E. Mm -hmm. The common rule. And so we begin to fill ourselves with news, how many of you are addicted to news, or you can't help but go back to the news? We're one step closer to Jesus coming again. Well, I don't care how you cover it, you're still being filled with the news, right? Did you see the Middle East is a hotbed? Okay, but Jesus is coming again. That's all that matters, right? But the news, man, it, it's, doing, it's filling me with something that's not good. Conservative or liberal, I don't care. None of it's good. It fills me with all the wrong things, right? And the last thing I should be looking at before I go to bed is all the conservative news. That's the last thing I should be looking at. Oh. <laughs> what about technology? I mean, I'll, I'll just keep going on the cell phone. Technology, our cell phones, when we go out to dinner, when we're spending time with our, when we're spending time in the same room as our families, but we're going, um, we're having this conversation, ding, oh, and we do this, right? But I'm still in the room with you, but I'm technically not with you. I am here now. And again, in the common rule, he talks about this too, and he says, when we do that, we fill this place in our heart that says that we can be omnipresent like God. I can be here with you, and I can be here with them at the same time, but no, you can't, right? So we're filling this void in our lives. What wells are we drinking from? You know, Jesus met the woman at the well in John 4, and he said to her, if you drink of me, you will never thirst again. How many of you are thirsty? How many of you have thirsted again? Listen, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm thirsty. 
thirsty at times because I'm drinking from the wrong wells. And so none of this is meant to cast, that, or to cast blame or point fingers or none of that. I'm telling you from my own experience, I struggle in the same areas. But the only way that we can drink from the well is that when we understand that when we read this book, it's not meant for our encouragement as much as it, as it is for us to read the heart of God. You know, we take a verse and we go, oh, I can use that verse today and it's going to make me feel good. Okay, that's great, but that's not all this is. This is meant to divide and, and, and cut the heart and the sinews of man so that we are walking according to the way that he wants us to walk. And to understand that his love for us is bigger than anything we can go through. And that his love is more fulfilling than the news or social media or the scrolling of my thumb on my phone. Right? You guys with me? There's all sorts of wells. I'm just going to throw some out there. Some of them are Netflix binges. That's a well people drink from, right? Um, fear. That's a well people drink from. The news, I already said that one. Busyness is a well that people drink from because it fills something in you that you are being counted on by all these people to do all these things and rather than being filled by God, you're being filled by other people's viewpoints. YouTube is another well, a well we drink from. And um, I'm gonna throw this one out there, friends. Friends can be wells that we drink from. I'm not saying that friends are a bad thing. I'm not saying that. But when friends take the place of Jesus, then they're bad things. Right? You guys with me? So, I don't know. I just feel like sometimes I miss out on so much of God because I fill my life with things other than Jesus. You know? So, um, here's, here's the last thing I'm going to say about this. Are, are we seeking Christ, or are we seeking modern-day Christianity? There's a vast difference. Mm -hmm. um, because Christ has much more to offer than modern-day Christianity does. Christ has so much more to offer. So verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory of the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So be it. So Paul now moves into this heart of worship, right? I believe he was already in this place of worship, but now he's revealing this moment that he's just going to worship God. His heart is turned toward Jesus and away from himself. And he says this, this statement, to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. That's how I've memorized it. But in, in the New King James, it says, above all that we ask or think. Okay? So Spurgeon teaches that Paul made those words up. He didn't have words to express what was really going on in his heart, so he made up the exceedingly abundantly above the, that concept. And um, you know, have you ever been in a in a position in your walk with the Lord where the Lord's doing something and you can't put words to what the Spirit's done? That's this moment, right? Paul is just like in this place with the Spirit, and he just there's these two worlds. There's this spiritual world and this physical world. He's living in both, and they speak a different language sometimes, right? And he has no words in the physical realm to put what's happening in the spiritual realm so that you can understand it. I think a lot like John when he was, when he was given the vision of Revelation, when he was given the Revelation that we're studying on Sunday morning, I think John a lot of times had had no words to express what was happening in the spiritual realm, right? The same concept. So here's Paul trying to express the magnitude of what's going on in his heart and his love for God, and he makes up this exceedingly abundantly more verbiage. 
But I want to ask you to think about that exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. So stop and think about that. How big is that to you? Are you thinking about how big that is? <coughs> now think bigger. Okay, are you thinking bigger? Yeah. Now think bigger, right? We can't even begin to understand the vastness of that. Just keep going, think bigger and think bigger. We went to go see the ark in, um, is that Indiana? Where's the ark? Kentucky? And that's their slogan, think bigger. Because when you look at this ark, you're like, oh my word, this thing is huge. And that, that's their slogan, think bigger. And that's how I think when I think of this statement by, by Paul. So to this God who could do far more than we could ever fathom in our infinite thinking, that's who God is. That's what Paul's saying. But have you ever stopped to think about God? Just stop to think about him. You know, it, have, at the beginning of the year, people go, oh, I have a word for the year, right? Do you guys ever do that? You have a word that God puts on your heart, and that's your focus for the year. And um, he usually gives me a word, and, and I think about it. And this year... For the last couple of years, I haven't had one. And I think, Kathy, you brought it up. And I'm like, well, I'll, I'll ask God for a word. And so I said, Pat, I want this word. And he said, that's not the word I'm giving you. <laughs> so I said, okay, Lord, well, what's the word? And I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. My word this year is worship. He's teaching me to worship him in everything, no matter what I go through. Good days, bad days, hard days. Uh, days I am condemning myself, all those days, I'm to go back to this place of worship. So I said, Lord, what does that mean? How do I worship you? I, I mean, come on, guys. I, I think you know what worship is, but I don't stop to worship him. And what does that mean? To just dwell in who he is. Not what he's done. Not what he's going to do. Not what I want him to do. But who he is. Have you ever stopped? As Paul is right here, exceedingly abundantly above all we could think or imagine, right? Have you ever just stopped and said, God, who are you? Have you ever stopped and thought about his character? His magnitude, his enormity, his power, his strength, his abilities, his wisdom, all his eternal facets, like a diamond, right? There's so many of them. He is exceedingly, abundantly above all that we have allowed him to be. Yes, I said that. He's more than we've ever allowed him to be. Just take a moment and allow God to come out of the box that you've created for And allow him to take that rightful place in your heart, that place where he sits on the throne of your heart, and you give him full access to all of it, and you hold nothing back. Nothing. Every position, every thought, every secret, every cobweb, give him all authority to the one who can do it exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. He strengthens us and then he uses us to accomplish his will. He uses us to show love to that co-worker who has persecuted us because of our faith in Christ. He uses us to forgive that person who's abused us and done awful things to us in our lives. He uses us to share the gospel to that person over there who seems to have their life all together and they don't need Jesus. Or they're going to reject me because, right? But he's calling you ladies. And he has, he wants to have that full access. He wants to do a work in your heart. He wants you to be filled with all the fullness of God so that he can do the work that he needs to work. And he's using you to do his work. Would you allow him that? To him be the glory, not me, not us.
not to us be the glory. We want to take his glory because that's just the fallen nature of man, but to him be the glory in the church. That's us. Because I'm too small to reveal his glory, but the church combined can reveal his glory, right? Mm -hmm. To him be the glory in the church throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.